month of violence and over 800 civilian deaths later, Sudan's warring parties have signed a seven-day ceasefire agreement, seventh since the fighting began on April 15. Will this ceasefire hold or will it fall apart like earlier attempts at truce? There's a new face on the block as Florida Governor and Republican Ron DeSantis has announced his candidacy for the US presidential elections in 2024, entering an already crowded primary contest. And finally, a historic win in the struggle of indigenous groups in Australia, claiming back their heritage as the Western Australian government, agrees to pay damages for mining on indigenous lands. Welcome to Daily Debrief. This is your host, Shriya, and these are today's stories. After nearly a month of fighting Sudan's warring factions, the Sudanese army forces and the paramilitary rapid support forces have signed a written agreement for a seven-day truce to provide free passage for humanitarian assistance. The latest ceasefire in Sudan, unlike its predecessors, includes a monetary me- monitoring mechanism where cross-party committee will track violations. While welcoming the ceasefire, left activists in the African nation pointed out the absence of any civilian representation who faced the brunt of the ongoing conflict. We go to Prashant now, who has more details on this story. Thanks for joining us, Prashant. Uh, first off, uh, so a lot of ceasefires have happened in Sudan since the fighting began, but they've not been successful. What is uh, significant about this particular ceasefire? Right, Shriya. So, uh, just to give some context before we answer the question, we know that the fighting broke out between the Sudanese armed forces and the paramilitary rapid support forces uh, on April 15th. And we've had nearly one month of fighting. The fighting was over disagreements over how, whether the RSO should be integrated into the armed forces or not, when, what is the timeline, etc. But there is a long tradition of both these forces that are part of the military junta oppressing people and these generals have come been responsible for a lot of crimes. So that's the context. Now, uh, in the one month that the fighting has taken place, the impact has been really brutal. Um, over 1 million people have been displaced. I think the number of civilian deaths alone is 800 plus. So there's been a constant demand to sort of uh, you know, bring about some kind of ceasefire. There have been attempts in the past, but almost all of them have not held being broken within hours. The difference this time is that there is a mechanism for monitoring it. The ceasefire was negotiated uh, with the mediation of the US and Saudi Arabia, in Jeddah, which is in Saudi okay. Arabia. So there is a monitoring mechanism of over 12 members with three members from each of the parties. That's the armed forces, the RSF, US and Saudi Arabia. So, uh, as for the, how the ceasefire is going, there are reports of violations. It's not that it's been a crystal clean, uh, you know, uh, situation so far. Both the army and the RSF have been accusing each other of continuing this fighting. However, the general reportage from the area is that overall things have been much more quieter since the ceasefire began, which is definitely a very welcome, uh, move, very welcome situation. Now, it is a question. This is a seven-day ceasefire. It took effect on Monday evening, which means it's only. Uh, and we have just a few more days to go. Now, this ceasefire can be extended. Whether that will happen or not remains to be seen. But uh, the fact that it is even happening is significant because, like I said, the impact was really horrible. We saw, you know, clashes breaking, breaking out in the Darfur region again in the larger context of this one. We saw the fact that, uh, you know, there was huge shortage of electricity, water, essentials, people leaving Khartoum and other cities in droves, people being scared of leaving despite wanting to leave because the fact that they were afraid that while trying to flee they would be shot down or anything of that sort. A lot of the fighting was through air attacks because the RSF controlled certain key installations and the army would bomb them. So it is not even that uh, and the, the, the fighting was entirely in, uh, with uh, very close to civilian areas. So it is not just two military groups fighting but civilians really being caught in the crossfire. So this was a very difficult situation. A large percentage of hospitals were taken out of action, either bombed or had run out of equipment. So things were getting very harrowing, were, are harrowing for the people of Sudan. There's no question of that. And uh, the fact that even there is a minor amount of reduction in violence, so that for that reason is good. Now, I think the key question here is, uh, regarding the ceasefire itself, whether it will continue. Now, the problem here is that it doesn't seem like uh, there are conditions good in the, in the, the conditions for the ceasefire not continuing are pretty good, so to speak, in the sense that neither armed group has really gained enough of an advantage over the other, the, and the situation is still more even which means that there is a lot of incentive to keep fighting. And the, if you look at the statements and the declarations, both of them are kind of said that, you know, we'll keep the war going, etc., etc., which means that it will require a lot of incentives and push pressure of various kinds from the mediating forces to sort of ensure that fighting does not take place. So it's going to be a bit of a seesaw in the next couple of days where to see if the uh, ceasefire will be extended. 
the important thing I think to note is that, uh, you know, for the people of Sudan, this will pro provide some relief, but I, it will not address the serious structural questions. And what has been the reaction like from left parties and activists in Sudan regarding this ceasefire? So, I think uh, we have an article which talks about this by our colleague Pawan. And I think uh, if you look at, for instance, what the Sudanese Communist Party is saying, there are two or three uh, things it may, makes clear. One is the fact that they are very clear that these humanitarian corridors through which aid is delivered should not be in the hands of the army or the RSF. They are saying that it will be looted and, you know, all the uh, supplies will go to these forces instead of going to the people. So, so they have called for the neighborhood resistance committees. Uh, the neighborhood resistance committees are small groups which have mm. been in the forefront of both protests for democracy and for providing relief during the fighting. They have called for these committees, say Sudanese Red Crescent, for the Sudanese Doctors Union, for these groups to, to preside over the provision distribution of relief rather than the armed forces or the rapid support forces. It, they also cautioned against, for instance, you know, ceasefire being an occasion for people to leave Sudan in droves. So the idea that it should not be an invitation for people to leave as my people have to stay where they are, right? And safety conditions are to be provided for them rather than people giving being given the impression that this ceasefire is just so that you can leave so that we can continue fighting, right? And I think they also warned against the US and Saudi Arabia taking monopolizing the negotiations, so the fact that the African Union is not on the ground, yeah. the fact that, you know, civil society organizations, I think the Sudanese Communist Party made a very good point when they said that the civilians who have suffered the most are not part of the monitoring mechanism, right? So, these are some of the immediate responses to the ceasefire, but I think the larger structural question also remains, we have talked about this multiple times on this show, which is that as long as the generals in the army and the RSF are considered a key part of any solution, it's very difficult to see how the situation is going to change. The army and the RSF together were responsible for repressing civilians. They were the props behind the Omar al-Bashir regime, which was in power for a very long time. So to somehow suddenly expect that the same army and RSF together will help transition to democracy is really, I think, being very uh, you know, delusional, for lack of a better word. But the international community for the longest time has been okay with the fact that this army and the RSF are part of the process, right? So I think that's a larger critique and which is why the protesting forces, the civilian protesters have always insisted that uh, there should be no compromise, no understanding with the military. They have called for true meaningful democracy, which means that the army is subordinated uh, to the military as well. So keeping all that in mind, I think those are, and, and uh, like we keep saying on this show, I think those are the largest structural questions that remain. Uh, for uh, Sudan as a whole because even if this bout of fighting comes to an end, we might end up with another bout of fighting in some months, another, you know, military coup or whatever. So, the question is that what is the status of the security forces? Uh, can, will they, will the control of the economy be divested from them? All these are, I think, important questions that need to be addressed. Right. Thank you so much for joining us, Prashant. Florida Governor and Republican Ron DeSantis has announced his candidacy for U.S. presidential elections in 2024. DeSantis made the announcement through a campaign video ahead of joining Twitter CEO Elon Musk on the social media platform. The entry of DeSantis has been rumoured for months and he is also being considered as Donald Trump's strongest rival in the primary contest. We are joined by Anish for more on this story. Hi Anish, thanks for joining us. First off, uh, can you tell us how does the entry of DeSantis in the presidential race at this point of time change the dynamics uh, of the race? Well, it's quite hard to say. It's quite early to say uh, how things will be changed. Uh, but what we need to note is the fact that Ron DeSantis, uh, who is currently the governor of Florida, is really not that much of a different uh, public figure uh, when we compare him to, say, Donald Trump. Now, Trump is definitely uh, the front runner of this entire race. We have uh, multiple uh, polls talking about how a majority of Republican voters are more likely to opt for Trump than any other candidate uh, at the moment. Or uh, one, we need to remember his performance during the COVID-19 pandemic, where he essentially, uh, you know, towed the line with Trump. He was one of the Republican governors to do that. He uh, went against all sorts of uh, recommendations and health advisories uh, that called for, uh, you know, social distancing or for that matter, masking. And even uh, when it came to uh, COVID vaccines, uh, he pretty much uh, was one of the anti-vaxxers, anti-vaxxer uh, anti governors in uh, the United States. 
even if you look at some of the record of how uh, you know covid uh, 19 death toll uh, was managed uh, there is definitely also uh, you know several reports that indicated that the government his administration had actually covered up certain uh, numbers just so that they could uh, you know they could actually uh, create a, a sort of data uh, database that would make it look as if florida wasn't doing as bad as uh, it actually was so in you know, a whole lot of things, he wasn't really different from how Trump uh, worked as uh, the president. He was pretty much the mini Trump in Florida. And, uh, but definitely he's a polarizing figure, not just in Florida. Uh, I mean, mostly in Florida, if you look at the winning margin with which he has become the governor, it's a very tiny one. And that clearly shows how polarizing he is over there. And also, uh, with, uh, if he has any kind of capability to actually eat into Trump votes is something that we are yet to see. Uh, obviously, uh, Trump's current, uh, you know, being beleaguered with all sorts of cases and investigations against him, ranging from, uh, you know, sexual harassment to, uh, to uh, you know, actually, uh, you know, uh, fund uh, siphoning of funds uh, from uh, while uh, being the president of uh, you know tax fraud and all sorts of other cases that are against him, he is definitely uh, he's still seen as somebody who is far more favorable to most Republicans than uh, than most other candidates. But we need to really uh, wait and see how his entry, DeSantis's entry. I mean, his uh, definitely the beginning was not very. Uh, good considering the kind of snag that he uh, his campaign had actually had to face, the technical snag we all know about. Right. And Anish, you mentioned apart from DeSantis, there are other Republican candidates also in the race. You mentioned Donald Trump. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about these other candidates from the Republican end and uh, who should we look out for the most in the coming days? Well, apart from DeSantis and Trump, obviously, uh, the, there is definitely Nikki Haley, who is a former president of South Carolina. Uh, she is uh, one of the more you know establishment Republicans, uh, and uh, while she has been in, you know in several instances very pro-Trump on major issues, uh, she is definitely one of these old like she belongs to that club of uh, old conservatives. Uh, I mean, she's not old, but like the very traditional kind of conservatives that uh, used to kind of uh, uh, represent the Republican Party for a very long time. And so uh, she, uh, there is definitely uh, there is a, definitely a great deal of likelihood that the more co the conservative bloc who do not necessarily identify with the sort of new right or the alt-right or kind of populist uh, tendencies within the Republican Party that has now gone over to uh, Donald Trump's campaign, not just now, but like even during his presidency and before uh, as well, uh, are more likely to, you know, uh, organize around her. So this is one other candidate. There are definitely going to be uh, more. Uh, we can obviously expect uh, several uh big and small figures and some even unknown figures to come up uh, with candidates candidacy announcement in the coming months. Uh, and that is not going to be new because uh, if you remember the last uh, Republican primary event, uh, Trump actually won. Uh, it was a massive uh, lineup, uh, almost a dozen candidates uh, who wanted to become the party's nominees. Uh, but obviously, uh, only one person of the uh, only a couple of them actually ended up being in the race entirely, or at least for the most part, uh, by the by the time the primaries actually began. So uh, these three are the ones that we can look out for at the moment. Uh, on the uh, overall perspective, if you look at it, uh, the Republican primary will be important definitely. But what is going to be significant is how. Uh, the ongoing cases, especially the indictment uh, with Stormy Daniels case, uh, is going to actually affect uh, Trump's campaign, whether it is going to uh, you know, turn him out to be a martyr that his campaign is trying very hard to uh, paint him as, or whether uh, it is actually going to affect his uh, standing as a popular figure within the Republican Party. Thanks for that update, Anish. We Please hang on. We'll be back with you for our next story.
The Australian government set a historic precedent this week by agreeing to compensate an Aboriginal group for acts such as approving roads and issuing leases that damaged or destroyed the group's legal rights over their traditional lands. The settlement with the indigenous people of Western Australia will pay the group over 17 million US dollars and will also allow for a greater say for the indigenous group on future developments by miners and others on issues including water management and mining or even petroleum leases. It also removes the need for future compensation claims. Anish is back with us for more updates on this story. Welcome back, Anish. Uh, the first question is, uh, what do you think is the significance of a settlement like this? Well, it's quite unprecedented in the manner in which uh, the, uh, the Western Australian uh, government uh, actually uh, dealt with this issue. Uh, they negotiated with the uh, the tribe, the community, and they actually came up with a solution eventually, and also came up with the fact that uh, that uh, Aboriginal native title owners uh, are entitled to compensation for pretty much any activity that happens on their lands, which includes building of roads, uh, you know, even constructing pipelines, or for that matter, mining. Now, this is uh, significant in the sense that this is going to definitely set a precedent for how the government uh, deals with uh, very similar cases that we have always uh, talked about, uh, not only in the show, but also on our website, uh, in across Australia, where uh, native landowners are actually uh, impacted by such massive projects, very often mining projects. And uh, considering the fact that Western Australia being one of the biggest uh, repositories of all sorts of natural resources that Australia has to offer, along with the fact that it also has uh, one of the largest, uh, or maybe second only to uh, the Northern Territory uh, province, uh, the largest num uh, number of uh, native landowners, or for that matter, native land in itself, uh, shows that uh, this is going to have a significant impact on not just uh, how native titles are dealt with, but also the mining industry as well. The mining industry will have to take uh, into account not only uh, you know the fact that these landowners will have to be compensated with, but also how uh, their cultural artifacts and their uh, historic and cultural sites should be protected and how uh, they can be involved in any such process uh, from here on. You know, Anish, uh, three years ago, a similar incident took place. A uh, mining company named Riot Into It blasted a 50,000-year-old uh, sacred site of the one of the uh, Aboriginal groups. Uh, what do you think this particular settlement that we're talking about, what kind of an impact, a positive impact, a negative impact, what kind of an impact it will have on similar such cases and on the future of uh, claiming back indigenous heritage in Australia? Well, it is quite an interesting time right now in Australia when it comes to Aboriginal uh, or indigenous uh, groups and communities uh, trying to uh, claim back their lands uh, and also their cultural heritage. Uh, so it, it is interesting that you mentioned Riot Into because Riot Into is primarily the reason why the settlement happened in the first place. The fact that something of that sort was possible uh, by existing laws and by existing regulations and almost very little could be done when it comes to legal and uh, you know legislative uh, remedies that can happen. Uh, uh, it is because of that that there was this urgency uh, in Western Australia, especially with the government, that they had to actually uh, fine-tune some of the existing regulations uh, on uh, to actually come up with some uh, something like this, a settlement like this. Now, uh, what we need to remember is that while this is going to set a sort of customary precedent, uh, it is not a legislative or a, you know, a legal act. Like This is not going to be set in stone, something that can obviously change if the government changes. So it is. Uh, it remains to be seen how the government, the state government, and obviously uh, the federal government uh, in Australia is going to uh, institutionalize such uh, settlements. Because once you have that sort of institutional protection, it becomes like it will become uh, a necessity for any kind of future projects. Uh, and uh, interestingly, we are looking at similar cases of, uh, you know. Uh, Aboriginal or uh, indigenous groups in Australia 
uh, filing court cases, uh, trying to get back their land. We have seen a similar court case actually uh, give about thousands of kilometers of land that, uh, in Victoria back to the indigenous group that claimed it. Uh, we are also seeing very similar fight for compensation uh, in Western Australia itself, multiple of them. There are multiple cases. Uh, one was filed in March uh, uh, earlier this year. So in all of these cases, and in obviously right into we are all, uh, uh, today we are uh, reading reports about how uh, the company and the indigenous group, the Juhukan group, are actually uh, have gotten into mediating uh, this uh, issue and also coming up with a solution and maybe possible compensation in the future because it has been three years and pretty much nothing has been done uh, on the front by riot itself. So in all of these cases, definitely we are looking at a time when indigenous groups are becoming more assertive about their rights, about their native uh, titles about their rights to the land itself and uh, obviously it's going to have an impact uh, we need to see if the governments uh, like there are all, all, all already cases and like uh, calls made by legislators and uh, you know even civil society groups that are calling for uh, native uh, the changes in native uh, uh, legislations in the country so that there could be greater right and greater say for Aboriginal groups towards their, uh, you know, cultural and natural heritage. And that clearly shows that the times are changing and there will be definitely more reforms, hopefully something to a more positive outcome in the near future. Right. Thank you so much for joining us today, Anish. And that's all we have for today. For more such stories, keep watching peoplesdispatch.org. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram.